Did you know that modern love songs come from 12th century French poetry? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and in honour of Valentine's Day and the season of love, we're going to have a look at the literary genre of courtly love from the High Middle Ages. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week, so make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. When we say courtly love, what are we actually talking about? Well, we're talking about a literary genre of poetry that began in the south of France in the 12th century, during the period known as the High Middle Ages. In this new genre of poetry, motifs were established that are still commonly used today in the romance genre. And it also elevated the position of women in society during this time. Prior to courtly love, women appeared in medieval literature as secondary characters and as a possession of either their father or their husband. In courtly love poetry, though, women were transformed into characters that were clearly defined individuals, usually idealised, and were almost always married or unattainable in some other way, and so would become the sole focus of a noble knight's devotion, service, and self-sacrifice. The historicity of this genre of literature is still hotly debated as to whether it was simply a fanciful metaphor or if it actually reflected the relationships of the upper class at the time. Scholars have also suggested the genre was a religious allegory relating to the heresy of Catharism, whilst others claim that it simply represented the superficial games of the medieval French court. But more on that later. We still don't really know, but what we do know is that this genre of literature was unlike anything before it in medieval Europe, and it coincided with the idealization of women. It contributed to the constantly evolving Arthurian legend and standardized many themes and motifs of the Western ideal of romantic love. The emergence of courtly love in southern France in the 12th century is all thanks to the troubadours or poet minstrels, who would either travel from town to town or be retained by a local court to provide their entertainment. According to some scholars, it was William IX, Duke of Aquitaine, who lived between 1071 and 1127, who was the first troubadour, and even if he wasn't the first, he certainly is the most famous of the early troubadours. If you have watched our video on Eleanor of Aquitaine, you may recognise his name, since he is the grandfather of Eleanor, who would eventually become the Queen of France and then the Queen of England. Now, William IX wrote a new kind of poetry, a sensual poetry, full of romantic love and the praise of women that was continued by those who followed him. Although they didn't refer to it as courtly love poetry, to them it was simply poetry, albeit very different than the usual literature for that time. The love that the troubadours were praising wasn't marital love, but an extramarital or premarital love, freely chosen and passionately pursued completely in contrast to marriage, which was often arranged with some sort of social or economic benefit in mind. The upper class medieval marriage was completely out of the hands of the woman who would be passed from father to husband to further some sort of agenda. And the woman was nothing more than an object used in a financial or political transaction. No fun, no passion. But with courtly love, the women were free to choose their own lover and they had complete control over their lover who was passionately devoted to their service. Did this reflect the social reality of the time, or was it a literary construct? As noted, this is an ongoing debate, but a central figure in this debate is none other than Eleanor of Aquitaine. As one of the most powerful women of the Middle Ages, Eleanor of Aquitaine's role in developing the genre of courtly love is still controversial. 
Throughout her life, she lived as she wanted, regardless that she was first Queen of France and then Queen of England. Well, except for that time that she was imprisoned by her husband, King Henry II of England. And during her life, she was an avid patron of the arts, a pursuit that most of her children would follow. During her marriage to King Louis VII of France, she filled her court with poets and artists, and after their annulment, she kept up the tradition in her court in Normandy. When she married Henry II of England, one of the greatest medieval poets, Bernard de Ventador, followed her to the English court and remained there with her for three years, probably as her lover. Neither Louis nor Henry had very high opinions of the troubadours, but Eleanor held them in high esteem. And after her separation from Henry, she set up her own court at Poitiers and surrounded herself again with artists. There is no doubt that Eleanor inspired Bernard de Ventador, and it is very likely that she and her daughter, Marie de Champagne, inspired the greatest and most influential works of courtly love literature. One of the main controversies surrounding Eleanor of Aquitaine are the courts of love, which may have occurred at her court at Poitiers between circa 1170 and 1174. Some scholars say that her daughter Marie was present, and others say she wasn't. Some scholars argue that actual courts of love were held there, with Eleanor, Marie and other highborn women presiding over cases in which plaintiffs and defendants would present the evidence of problems in their romantic relationships, and others suggesting that courtly love literature was simply satire, and that these courts never really existed. Whatever it was that happened at Poitiers, however, established the ground rules of the literary genre and was further developed by Eleanor's daughter, who was the patroness of the poet Chrétien de Troyes, and the author Andreas Capellanus. Andreas Capellanus is the author of De Amore, or The Art of Love, which described these courts of love presided over by Marie and others and operated as some sort of manual on the art of seduction. Andreas's work draws on Ovid's Art of Love, which seems like it's a guide to romantic relationships, but it's actually mocking anyone who takes it seriously. Since Ovid's satirical work is such a close inspiration for Andreas's work, it has been used as a reason to read Andreas's work also as a satire, rather than serious guide to navigating love. According to Andreas, these are the four rules of courtly love which came from the courts of Eleanor and Marie. 1. Marriage is no excuse for not loving. 2. One who is not jealous cannot love. 3. No one can be bound by a double love. And 4. Love is always increasing or decreasing. What these suggest is that just because you're married doesn't mean that you couldn't find love outside of it. Jealousy is the clearest way to prove devotion. Everyone only got one true love, and you couldn't be in love with more than one person. And true love isn't static, but always dynamic, unpredictable, and ultimately unknowable. These four main concepts were then mirrored in Chrétien's poetry. Chrétien de Troyes is the poet responsible for some of the most well-known parts of the Arthurian legend, including the quest for the grail and the love triangle between King Arthur, Guinevere, and Lancelot. Chrétien established the central motifs that would carry through the genre of courtly love poetry, which include 1. A beautiful woman who is inaccessible, either because she is married or imprisoned. 2. A noble knight who has sworn to serve her. 3. A forbidden passionate love shared by both. And 4. The impossibility or danger of consummating that love. These concepts are best seen in Lancelot's love for Guinevere, as he cannot act on that love because she is queen and wife of King Arthur, Lancelot's best friend. Another famous example by Thomas of Britain is the story of Tristan and Isolt, where Tristan has to escort his uncle Mark's fiance, Isolt, to his castle. But of course, the two fall in love on their way, and it is this betrayal of Mark that drives the rest of the story. Eleanor's role in the development of these stories is continually debated, but just having some knowledge of her life pretty strongly suggests that she was of some inspiration to the genre, especially since she was never defined by her marriages or relationships with men. Another theory of courtly love poetry is that it's actually an allegory that depicts the beliefs of the Cathars, 
The Cathars were a religious sect that flourished in the south of France in the 12th century and rejected the teachings of the Catholic Church in the belief that they were immoral and that the clergy were hypocritical and corrupt. Catharism was dualist, which meant they saw the world as caught in an eternal struggle between good, which was the spirit, and evil, which was the flesh, and the church was on the evil side. Cathars lived simply and devoted themselves to helping others, and those who were Catholic but supported Cathar communities and protected them from the church were known as sympathizers. Why does this matter? Well, the church had a suspicion that Eleanor and Marie were sympathizers, and Catharism flourished during the time and in the region that Eleanor held her courts, and at the time courtly love poetry appeared. With the main belief of Catharism being the recognition of the female principle in the divine, which they recognized as the goddess Sophia, wisdom, the theory sees the damsel in distress in courtly love poetry as the goddess Sophia being held captive by the Catholic Church and the knight whose duty was to liberate her as the Cathar. One other theory is that courtly love was a social game played by the upper class in their courts, and as Georges Duby puts it, the lady in the story serves to stimulate the ardour of young men and to assess the qualities of each wisely and judiciously. The best man was the man who had served her best. This theory sees women as an object to be conquered, and once again seen not as an individual, but for her status. Another aspect of the genre, though, suggests that if courtly love was a game invented by women, they were both the prize and the judge, which elevates their status. Scholars have noted that there were games of roleplay engaged in up through the Renaissance, and the courts of love were part of this game, but for the game to be fun, everyone had to commit to it. It is possible these games were played over months, and perhaps this was what was happening at the court of Eleanor in Poitiers. But why works were so passionate and endured in popularity isn't fully explained by this theory. In the Middle Ages, women were generally belittled and devalued, but through the poetry of courtly love, they were elevated in a way that their culture did not support before. Women reigned supreme in courtly love poetry, regardless of the purpose of the literature, whether as a game of the court or a realistic reflection of the beliefs of the time. Although women would again be devalued by the end of the Middle Ages, the idealized vision of womanhood as defined by courtly love poetry was retained, and influences romantic songs and poems up through the present day. Do you think courtly love is still relevant today? How different is it from dating? And do we have similar rules nowadays? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more at our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find it under our merch tab down below. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you soon with another video.